everybody. Happy Friday, as usual. Do a very quick sound check. Make sure you guys can hear me okay. You never know. I think about 1 in 60 times it misses. But it looks like today it's going to work. And today we are live. So, hey everybody. As usual, <laughs> it's so funny. I've been talking about something going crazy for the last six weeks. Like normally August, September, or get kind of rocky. Not saying there's a guarantee of rockiness, but let's just jump right in. A lot of stuff to share with you all today. This channel's about math, money, freedom, and of course, it's edutainment. It's not investment advice. So please talk to your financial advisor if you have one. And uh, a lot of lot of really crazy stuff going on. And people might think, why do I care about China? What the hell is Evergrande? You'll find out. If you're in crypto, if you're in the stock market, you need to hear this. So let's go. First of all, let's look at the uh, market today. A lot of red. Uh, I call it the Evergrande rattles. And you see Ethereum, big hit, down 5%. Solana, still hovering, you know, dipped under the 140 a couple of times. I snagged a little bit more at the 136 level, coincidentally. It's like my favorite number. And Bitcoin is down. And that's it, really. The question is, why are things weak? And... Some select stock market items are very strong and some are weak too. But let's jump in and talk about exactly why we should care about Evergrande and what is it and talk about a bit of history as well. So this is Evergrande. It is a company with about 300 billion or they're not sure exactly. It could be a lot more than that of public debt, which is the same amount of public debt as Portugal. And I know we have a lot of Portuguese viewers here. So this will have, I believe, knock-on effects if they do default on their $300 billion of debt. If you look at the balance sheet of this company, it's crazy. They've got about $30 billion in assets and $300 billion in debt. This is why it's important to look at numbers. So basically, if these guys go under, it's going to wipe out not only all of their market cap, the $300 billion and all that debt, but also have huge knock-on effects. If you know anything about the construction business, the real estate business, what these guys do, the developers, you'll know that isn't things aren't just refined, you know, limited to one group, but the whole supply chain, all the vendors, all the tool companies, all the builders, they all need to be paid, and it's really bad. So if we look um, at China as well, China's comp Chinese companies, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on with China right now between the trade war in 2018 and stuff today and closing their borders and impacting IPOs and other things. But the Chinese companies are levered up like I've never seen. Just looking at some of the numbers, uh, Chinese companies' debt represented 160% of Chinese GDP. Think about that. Debt of those companies, 160% of Chinese GDP. And that compares to 85% in the US and 115% in Europe. Just like money printing, more money printing is happening in Europe than the US. And the companies are more levered. What's also interesting is the people that are holding this paper, and I'll talk more about them as well, but it includes names like Allianz and BlackRock and others. Let's see how this will affect crypto. But before we do, there's a couple of other stories we all need to hear. First of all, Evergrande, 90% loss for over 70,000 investors. That is hurting a lot of people. And remember, if you're in the stock market, these things can happen always. Only invest what you can afford to lose. So Beijing is apparently in no mood for another layman moment. For those of you who are old enough and were around in the 2008 financial crisis, I lived through it. Basically, it's very, very similar from a whole host of different metrics. First of all, Evergrande, a 300 billion pile of liabilities, is kind of the same knock-on effect as nearly Lehman Brothers, which is $600 million. They're also both real estate related, which is kind of scary. Now, if we look at the Chinese stock market, it is 3% from a six-year high. And the yuan, the, the, yuan the, digital the currency, not digital currency, the currency in China is trading near its strongest level in three months against the dollar. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. Why do we care about Chinese economy? Well, first of all, it's the second biggest economy in the world. Makes up nearly 16.5%, probably more at this stage because these are 2020 numbers that I pulled. The US economy is about 24%, but all economies were hit hard by C19. That'll remain nameless, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But remember, if China catches a cold, the world gets the flu. Don't read into that too much because it's a little political. Now let's talk about the Evergrande debt and why this actually matters. You can see here for a company with $300 billion in debt, 
and only 32 billion in assets, there's a whole bunch of paper, commercial paper, and you've been hearing about commercial paper and how it can be a little bit shaky in the background, especially in relation to Tether. And you'll see stories as well of a whole bunch of different players in the mix, like BlackRock. Remember, when paper gets shuffled around and people borrow against, it gets transferred, just like the subprime mortgage crisis. People were selling blocks of mortgages to companies who were selling blocks of mortgages to other companies. And at the end of time, you don't know who owns the actual paper. And that's important in a second. I'll talk to that. But let's talk a little bit about why concern is mounting over this developer's fate. Basically, China's nightmare, Evergrande scenario, is an uncontrolled crash. They tried to put some limits and caps on the amount that companies could borrow in 2020, but they were not successful. And I think President Xi was aware of some of this happening because some of the controls they put in place over the last few months seems to indicate that. So Beijing is facing a lot of pressure to intervene amid signs of contagion, financial contagion that could hurt a lot of Chinese investors and international investors too. So as a separate issue as well, just to bring it back to home, for those of you who don't know all this financial stuff is interrelated, the world's um, negative yielding bond pile is now over 18 to $20 trillion dollars of bonds that yield negative returns. Think about that. So this is a paper mess, house of cards, and this is going to give the bond market an already very bad black eye on top of what it already has. So this will all make sense in a little while when I get to it, but all roads is a little sneak preview. So financial contagion. For those of you who weren't around, this parallels Lehman, as I mentioned. Lehman Brothers, that triggered the whole financial crisis in 2008, which cost a lot of people a lot of money. And uh, we'll see what happens. But, you know, easily, easily $300 billion will be lost. Now, what does financial contagion look like? If you look at all the other property developers, this is kind of what it looks like. See those charts? These are all the main players, main property developers in China right now, and they are all tanking. And remember as well, when you look at the situation in China, I think about 28% of the economy is made up of real estate. And re like that's nearly a third. And that is just being crushed right now. And all the other developers are being hurt big time, as well as the stock market. So let's talk about September. And you've heard me say it for like weeks now, September sucks, September sucks, September sucks. But the Lehman Brothers crisis actually happened on the 12th of September which here we are, middle of September, same deal. Coincidence or not, there's a couple of little parallels I'm going to weave into this story here as well as we go forward. So the question is, are we staring down the barrel of a layman 2.0? And let me answer that and why it matters. So first of all, if you think about financial contagion and the knock-on effect to many different industries, that also impacts Tether, which also impacts many of you out there who are invested in crypto. So let's talk about crypto for a second. As we know, USDT has been claimed by many to be a house of cards. But the question is, could this be the catalyst to bring it all down? Just conjecture at this point. We don't know where this is going to go. But there's been so many rumors that a huge amount of paper that backs Tether is shaky. Very, very shaky. So let's talk about Tether. Tether say, hey, we don't hold any commercial paper issued by Evergrande. But that's not the point. As I mentioned before, Commercial paper is like magical stuff. It gets passed around and people forget what it's for and it just gets shoveled into envelopes and sold and resold and packaged up and played around with players like BlackRock, etc. So we'll see. Now, what is interesting to note is Tether do own about $30.8 billion of commercial paper and certificates of deposit. I'm pretty sure, considering the size of Evergrande, there could be a little bit of that in there and that could have an impact on Tether as well as we go forward. So the question is, Tether still claim no exposure, but Evergrande is the single largest high yield dollar bond issuer in China, accounting for 16% of all outstanding notes. This one company has nearly 20% of all US dollar bonds out of China. Think about that. Massive. That's how big this is. Let's go a little bit deeper. Again, still claiming no exposure, but... There is still a looming risk, and the question is why? The question is why, but basically, again, because of the nature and of the debt of all these China's assets that are tied up, 
it could still also be wrapped up in one way or another tied to a stable coin, even though it may not be in a bond directly. But we'll see where this goes. Let's talk about who is holding the bag today for Evergrande. This includes, look at these names. This will kind of crack you up. BlackRock, HSBC, a couple of not crypto friendly banks, I should I should mention, which is kind of ironic. UBS, Royal Bank of Canada, Prudential, Goldman Sachs, Allianz, and ramifications will be felt. This is not going to escape the Western world. This is not China only. And bonds are now trading, the Evergrande bonds are now trading apparently under 20 cents to a dollar. So over 80% has already been wiped and more than 95% of the stock value as well. So the question is, will more money printing follow? As we know, the C-19 pandemic, which I've mentioned already in this, and everything is related, uh, was brought about $40 trillion in global money printing, which is good for Bitcoin. The question is, the Evergrande collapse, China real estate crisis, will be, or could it be, the 2022-23 XX trillion fiscal monetary stimulus bailout plan for both Chinese companies, European banks, and uh, asset managers in the United States. We'll see. Now, what the really funny thing is, I put this slide together literally less than an hour ago, and guess what happened? You can't make this up. Within seconds of crafting the previous slide, China was just um, pumped 14 billion of cash into the market because of the Evergrande crisis. So like clockwork, money printing, they're still printing away, and we know what that means for us. So let's talk a bit about Evergrande and global debt. As I mentioned, China is lever to the hilt. We just saw the first domino fall and an Evergrande fire sale could crush prices, causing leverage developers to blow up, crippling the sector, which makes up 30% of the Chinese economy. That is not good, everybody. Also, the US is facing their own debt ceiling of its own, and a lot of debt is owed to Chinese organizations, which we just saw. Now, what happens if the US can't pay its debt and China can't get paid back or pay its own debts. How screwed are we? We'll see. But this is not this this is not going to just be something that is a nothing burger, as I say. This is going to be serious. We'll see how much is going to be hit. Now, Evergrande and global debt. Uh, this is an interesting tweet from Willem Middelkoop. He says, "Investors suddenly panic because Evergrande is not able to repay six hundred billion in debt." <laughs> when will they understand that the U.S. will never be able to repay $29 trillion in national debt? Again, 140% of U.S. GDP, that's how much the U.S. debt is. And European debt, even higher. So this is just crazy. That's why I always said the money printing has to always continue. Do you want to hold on to fiat? Let me know in the comments below. Now, this was also something that very funny. Just coincidence or a foretelling of another disaster? Evergrande, evergreen... I just leave that there for a second. I just thought, you know, there's just too too much coincidence, too much interconnectivity here. It's very, very bizarre. So the question is, what is the China endgame? This is an old book, but a very, very good, interesting book from Admiral Bill Owens as to exactly what China is planning. And the question is, it really may depend all on what President Xi decides, how to balance his goals of maintaining social and financial stability against his multi-year campaign to reduce moral hazard. And remember, property is the biggest bubble that everybody's been talking about in China for a long time. So if anything happens, this could clearly cause a lot of systematic risk to the whole China economy, the China plans, Xi's plans for global domination, etc., and may force a whole bunch of fire sales, which could actually be a positive down the line. Maybe they'll open up um, their technology and stocks to the US markets again. So we'll see. There could always be a silver lining, but in the meantime, it's going to be bumpy. Now let's get back to USDT and Evergrande, okay? All roads lead to Bitcoin. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Sorry for boring you all. But if Tether does have Evergrande exposure, USDT crashing could be bullish for crypto. And the question is why? If liquidity is an issue, people will just start to bulk converting their Tether or maybe even USDC and other stable coins, regardless of price, and pummel it into Bitcoin and Ethereum. Because as I always say, that is a flight to safety. I've been talking about this for months. Also, Chinese investors, once bitten, twice shy, will seek the safe haven they've been talking about. I've been talking about for months. Bitcoin becoming a safe haven asset in these crazy inflationary times. Think of the 
number of people in China that have been hurt, that have lost everything. Think about the people that paid $100,000 deposits on condos in buildings that are half complete. Where's their deposit gone? Gone. It's a, it's a real disaster, a real shame. So people are going to get hurt. People are going to lose everything. Now, Michael Saylor, of course, had to jump in. <laughs> Michael Saylor, as investors lose confidence in cash and credit instruments like the $305 billion in bonds nearing default, they are going to look for alternatives. The best alternative to bonds is Bitcoin. Digital property without counterparty risk of securities offers global appeal. Michael Saylor just repeated and tweeted what I've been talking about for a long time. So thank you. With that, you guys know the score. I'm going to show you this one last time without even saying any words. It's a disaster. It's going to hurt. It could hurt equity markets. It's going to hurt bond markets. It's going to hurt Chinese investors, Chinese real estate, and it's going to have a knock-on effect for a whole bunch of others. But the printing is going to have to continue. I don't think there's a way that the U.S. can start tapering now at this stage. So we'll see. Anyway, just want to share that with you. Nobody else is talking about it in the cryptoverse. So hopefully I'm first. Anyway, I'll open up to some Q&A and hope everybody's having a good Friday. And I really need a beer. <laughs> so if anybody has one, throw it my way. Instead, I have my usual, this always makes people laugh, my Dunder Mifflin coffee with ice and coconut milk, or I don't even know what one it is at this stage. So let's go. Let's jump in and see uh, what questions we have from everybody. And I'll take a little sip and digest. Luke Broyles, you're always first. It's inc it's uncanny. So, let me see. Mm. There's an idea of 18-year cycles for real estate prices. Any general thoughts on the thesis? And money printing burr nullify the argument. So I've been studying the Case Schiller Index. Luke, it's a very good question. Real estate related. I've read every book on real estate. I invest heavily in real estate. I love real estate. And I love crises like these because they bring about buying opportunities. So I've always believed in a seven to nine year cycle. When you look at the Case Shiller Index, you'll see that over time, every seven to nine years, there's a financial uh, a real estate crash. And sometimes it lags behind a stock market or financial crisis. And that's exactly how that works. So we'll see. I th think we in the US that so we have some fundamental macro problems with real estate is that there's not enough of it. And there's a lot of different segments of real estate. The lower segments are in trouble, middle and high segments. There simply isn't enough. And Real estate selling like hotcakes for cash. So we'll see. But I do see a lot of money now flooding into things like crypto and into safe haven assets and out of things like bonds, as I mentioned before. I've been saying that for a long time, but this is really going to accelerate the movement out of bonds. Um, and junk bond rates have shot up about 15% in China right now, literally over the last couple of days. Justin Esparza, how are you? Your non-financial advice is the best. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I currently have a mix of 3.25 ETH, 23 SOL, and 0 0.075 Bitcoin. Trying to get a Bitcoin to 0.1 ASAP. Is this a good mix? Um, I'm trying to calculate in my head exactly uh, how that means. So I always like your 32 to point to point 0.1 would be better. So you need to move your Bitcoin up to point 0.1 as quickly as possible to have that optimal ratio of Ethereum to Bitcoin, not financial advice, and just layer in as much Solana as you can. I am trying to get to the stage, and I'll never be able to get there, but I'd love to be a 50-50 between ETH and Solana. I know Ethereum's 800-pound gorilla, but I think uh, if, if the market really does rebound, which I think it will in October, things are going to be great for both Ethereum and Solana and Bitcoin, all the top players. So I think you have a very, very good allocation there. But just try keep, think about uh, 30 Sol to 3 ETH, and then try to get to 0.1 Bitcoin as quickly as possible. And that, that would mimic exactly what I do. I can't give you financial advice, but I can tell you how I structure my portfolio. Archit reads and travels. Thank you. I sold 25% of my ADA at 2.36, and I've set limit orders for Luna at 30 bucks. What that money? Is that a good decision? I wouldn't necessarily go into Luna. If you'd really like Luna, I'd go half Luna, but I think about getting some more Solana as well, or maybe some Elrond. Um, I, I just, I, the way I've, I've looked at Luna many, many times, I think it may have run a little bit too far too fast, kind of like Avalanche. And I like to have things with more upside to get into. So that's the way I see it right now. Luke, you're back again. Axie Infinity versus Engine. I know you'd probably prefer Engine, but could you explain why? Um, 
Another great question. So first of all, I'm not a gamer. I know very little about the gaming space. I am learning about the metaverse and how people trade stuff within video games and all that type of stuff. I just think Engine is kind of the safe player, but they have their own issues. I kind of like the Infinity play too, down the line, which is a sub element of Engine. And Axie Infinity, I am fascinated by the game, but I haven't bought any. I'm fascinated the way gamers in say western countries can allow gamers in poorer countries to play with their toys or whatever they play with i forget the name of the emoticon or whatever and make money so it's you, it's kind of a win-win kids can help kids and kids can earn money off other kids by playing video games it's just fascinating to me so i kind of like axie but i haven't bought any so hope that helps i think they're all good this whole gaming world is going to really explode the whole metaverse world and we are working on something on that exact topic so stay tuned mt uh, thinking of buying out the money call for january 22 in microstrategy but they are expensive what do you think they are extremely expensive what you need to do mt is if you're buying calls first of all don't buy short-term calls because you don't know what's going to happen over the next 90 days it's always extremely risky we have a much better idea of telling what's going to happen over the next year year and a half so for example if the evergrande crisis becomes endemic and cause a huge financial crisis, you're going to be left in hot water if everything gets pulled down, which could include Bitcoin. So from that perspective, try by at least 12 to 18 months. That'll save you on taxes as well. And it'll give you much more options. It'll cost more money too. But I, I never buy short term at the money calls. If I was doing a short term play, because I had a feeling about an earnings report being blowout, then I'd be 50% intrinsic value, 50% time value. So hope that helps um sticky bandits how does alchemy fit in your model i have looked at alchemy and i forget how it scored but we did score it so hang on a second this will be quick i know sometimes people getting a little upset if we let me see uh alchemy hold on <laughs> Got to pull up the model. So, oh, yeah. Oh, it didn't do well at all. It scored a 3.8 out of 10, which is really low. And part of the problem is very high inflation, centralization, poor insider distribution, circulation, etc. Sorry, Alchemy did not score very well at all, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, sorry about that. And Jason Patrick Saunders, new to crypto, but it currently have 22 Sol, half an ETH, 505 Cardano, 220 Matic, half a Bitcoin, 100 Engine, 100 Rally. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking at Rally myself. Um, should I focus on Bitcoin and ETH from here? I think uh, Bitcoin, ETH, and Sol are the, the now, for, as far as, again, people think I'm shilling stuff, I'm not. If I was if I was shilling stuff, I wouldn't uh, say the type of stuff I say. I but I do honestly believe in our models, and I believe in risk management, and I believe in the safer plays. So right now, Bitcoin is safest, and Ethereum, because it's the incumbent, very safe despite their problems, and Solana growing very fast despite their problems too. So I like the fifty fifty hedge. So I kind of like that. Um, in terms of other things, I actually like Matic as well. I have a little bit of engine, but you know, if I was going to raise money because of a crisis or something, I I might get rid of some of my smaller, lower cap cryptos, which would include things like Chili's, uh, my purely speculative plays, and etc. So that's kind of where I see. Uh, has your Matic price target changed at all? Uh, no, it hasn't. It's been very stable. I'm just waiting for the market to wake up and realize the value. So N31, thank you for your question. Yug7228, I have a large bag of link, and if I were to trade it for my, my tax consequences, wouldn't be high. I have a small bag of Matic. Should I convert some link to Matic? I think, I think link is the safe, safe play with very little downside. But once Ethereum starts taking off, I do see uh, Chainlink going to like 78 bucks, not financial advice. And I see... Uh, Matic doing a triple as well. So I see them both going up the same amount. So if you do have like a 20% tax penalty, I just probably stay where you are. So just just to see. But then again, I think there's a lot of untapped value in Matic too uh, in the near future. 
And Mr. B70 have 20, a lot of crypto questions. I thought people would be asking questions about the Chinese crisis. I have 20 sol um, at 35 US dollars. Good job. Uh, what would be my exit strategy? So I see Solana going from anywhere from 400 to 700 dollars this bull run. So hang tight. And when we get closer to the bull run, I will be sharing all of my custom crypto exit models by token. And uh, I'll be sharing them with you for those who want to get out. There's certain cryptos I'll always hold and I won't be getting out of. But for those who really want to take some money off the table, I'll show you how. And uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but in the meantime, no panic, but we will be going up. And in terms of, do you think uh, selling all altcoins and profit for Bitcoin, good idea or try to try to stay a whole coiner? I love being a whole coiner, but, uh, you know, hold on to the high quality cryptos that will run faster. I mean, everybody's talking about Bitcoin easily going to 100,000 this year. Um, even despite us being late, many people are calling for more than 200, 250, 288, 400, some crazy number or something, 350. So uh, we'll see. I'm more conservative. I think close to the six digit mark is what we'll get to. But it might also spill over into next year, but we'll see. There's going to be a lot of financial stuff going on right now, which could delay things as well as we go forward. Cerberus, haven't seen you in a while. Team New Zealand is on the line. Um, you mentioned before that you reviewed the Solana projects and did not like any at the time. Can you share the cons of Serum? I can indeed. They all typically have the same problem, and that is poor tokenomics. So um, if you look at Serum... Their inflation is 3,300%. <laughs> I don't even need to go anymore, but just check out um, check out CoinMarketCap. Look at some of the stats. Read the white paper, and you, you'll see for yourself. It's just the, the tokenomics is just horrible. And I know they give a lot of the crypto away and for staking rewards and other things and use it for utility, but it's just that type of stuff is crazy. And uh, I don't like high inflation tokens. Uh, Eric, I up. Patian, I hope I got that right. I'm 22. Congratulations for being young and investing. Very proud. Invest in Bitcoin, but I need my money for business and feel anxious that I'll be too late. Can you calm me down? Well, you, there's a couple of things that you should always invest in first. One is your castle and two is your business or your business first and your castle because without those, you can't survive. So speculating uh, without having a stable homestead first is very, very important. So there'll always be time to get in. So what I suggest for you, Eric, is invest as much as you can in your business. Get your business as successful as possible, as quickly as possible. Start saving cash. And if there is a dip when you have extra cash flow, stick some Bitcoin on your balance sheet when the time is right. But uh, yeah, you got to build your you got to build your business first. Tim Koval, do you think the CCP is cracking down on other verticals knowing that they'll have to bail out Evergrande? Safe face with the population. Yeah, the... the so what people don't really know is how much money printing the Chinese have done, and they are printing a ton like everybody else. And soon, I think within less than two years, they'll have the digital one available, which means they'll just be able to literally press a button, trillion, 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 all day long. So they know the money printing, the modern money theory better than anybody. I don't think they care. But I think this might teach President Z a little bit of humility. I hope he's not listening, by the way. Um, but, you know, the, the, the world works best when there's open trade. And his authoritarian communist style is, is not good for global success. I mean, the Chinese were very successful over the last 20 years with global trade. Now they're trying to just do global domination. So um, I think... I always see the best in people and humans. I think they'll come around after this saying, okay, maybe we need a little more regulation. Maybe we need to cap the amount of borrowing these types of companies do. We need to protect our citizens so they don't lose $100,000 when they buy a condo in whatever city, Guangzhou, or whatever. And I think this could bring about a new uh, way of thinking. But the way it's currently working with their hard-handed autocracy is not a way to build a, a good country. Broke Bank Vegan. To help all the animals, what's your favorite country you've lived in and your top three favorite cuisines? Oh, <laughs> that's a fun one. Thank you for that. Um, I love uh, northern Italy and southern Switzerland. I love southern Germany. Um, but the weather can be a little bit bad in the winter. But my probably my favorite place on earth is Como in Italy. 
I think it's just so beautiful there. And I love Italian food, despite all the carbs. And uh, I also love Indian food. And I like to make Indian food, Italian food, and grill. Grill anything on the smoker, vegetables and stuff like that. So I hope that helps. Uh, but, but yeah, Jonathan Hernandez. Um, oh, can I have your opinion on if you created a cold wallet? If I created a cold wallet for my 12-year-old son and bought him some Bitcoin for his birthday and Christmas, should I hold it for him or teach him responsibility? Um, what I what I would do is I give him a... <laughs> this is going to sound really sneaky, but he's 12, just in case. And you don't want to lose your Bitcoin. I give him a fake wallet and teach him how to use it or put a tiny bit on it, but hold the real one with 95% of the value on it. Keep that for him. Like let him know it's in his name, but just in case he screws up or maybe just give him the fake one and say, here's your crypto. Keep it safe. I'm going to check on you every month, first of every month and make sure you know you where it is and you remember your seed phrase and that type of stuff. And that would be the best thing. And that way it'll be ingrained in his mentality going forward, which would be crazy. Also important to remember those 12 words in his head and maybe go on vacation with your boy and then quiz him at the beach. Whisper me your seed phrase gently and see if he remembers it off by heart. So that'd be cool. And thank you for your donations as well for the animals. Oscar, Mike, uh, Tim Cavell, thanks for your work. Yay for this. Joseph Punti and Jonathan Cateno. Cateneo. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody's having a great Friday. Couple more questions here. Oh, Light Chaser Photo. Big thank you for your donation. This will make a big difference for the furry ones. Donated fund by Ada, which is now in Solomon Bitcoin. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not, well done. I'm not going to get into that political stuff. Uh, Jonathan Cataneo, how are you again? Uh, how do you how do we see your full list of cryptos and rankings? Is it a Patreon only benefit? If so, when will more slots be opening? Ah, oh, I get this question a lot. So, unfortunately, Patreon is all sold out. Um, I I don't do this for commercialism, but um, otherwise people say, why don't you just open up, open up? But that's not that's not the way we run here. Um, so sorry for any convenience. However. Sometimes people cancel their memberships, uh, so feel free to check back in to the website and see if there are any seats. So many people have sniped seats like the way we snipe crypto. And in terms of how you see my full list of cryptos, I talk about them a lot. I, uh, If you go to my should I buy videos, I talk about the ones that I buy and I let you know. And also check out my retire on crypto video I did back on June 22nd. That has my top 10 crypto holdings. And I've only sold one of them. And I mentioned it yesterday, what that one was. So I'm very, very transparent. I don't shill. I invest where I believe the most opportunity is. And I share everything that I know. So hope that helps. And uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff happens in that other community. So Kevin Cross, uh, will USCC be safe as a store while waiting for a bottom in the crypto market? Or do we need to pull back to a fiat currency? It's hard to say. So Imagine a scenario where USDT blows up. That's going to pull uh, USDC a little bit down with it. Not that much. And um, that's that's what I would say. So we may have to go back to fiat just for safety. Or I think Pax Gold is a gold-backed um, crypto stablecoin. That might be worth having a look at too. I know there's a guy, uh, Coin Bureau. <laughs> Not there's a guy, a guy, a guy called Guy at Coin Bureau uh, likes Pax Gold, so uh, that could be an option too. But I can have a look at that. But there could be a time where well, I'll be monitoring this very carefully. What happens at Evergrande, and if things do go bad, Kevin, you'll be the first to know, and hopefully we'll have time to position ourselves. Uh, the OC agent, I have a 50k in Fidelity Growth Fund, thinking about cashing out and buying more Bitcoin. Have one Bitcoin, 14 half ETH, 170 Sol. Any thoughts? Yeah, so um, congrats on your one Bitcoin, but you're a little light on your ETH and your... Well, your SOL is good, actually, at nearly 200. Uh, in a perfect world, this is... Everybody's dream bag would be 32 ETH, 300 SOL, one Bitcoin. So if it, that's kind of like the number that I think. So even if one blows up, you have two that will be worth at least 
a million dollars by the year 2030. So not financial advice, but they, they're the type of metrics that I like to think of when people ask me this question. Not financial advice, of course. But what I would do, uh, 50K Fidelity Growth Fund, I hate mutual funds. <laughs> I, I can do much better myself, just even doing covered calls or waiting for two months or a month and then picking an equity and watching it bounce. So uh, yeah, you sound like you know what you're doing. You've got a very nice balance of crypto. Yeah, mutual funds are just, they're just going to shrink by 15%. So even if your fund goes up 15%, and the currency is debasing by 15%, you're at zero. So move it to hard money, not financial advice. Ask your financial advisor if you should do it. And if he works at Fidelity, he'll say, no, <laughs> you shouldn't do that because that's their lifeblood. Anyway, Tim Cavell, uh, if Tether is exposed since paper can be passed around, who isn't included? Exactly. That's what's called contagion. You nailed it. So basically everything is interrelated. Everything is linked, like literally the guy who is a laborer on a construction site in China building these places, he is impacted. He may never get paid. He may have been working for 90 days and not get paid. He's got a family at home to feed and stuff. So everybody get hurts, gets hurt. And if you look at the companies I listed, like the BlackRock and the Allianz, the Prudential, these are the people holding the bags. And when they get hurt, they're going to knock on the government store and say, give me a bailout, or they're going to jack up the price of the products or take more money from their customers. It's just, it's all a zero-sum game, uh, with the exception that money printing will continue. That's the one thing we are sure of, which means currency will debase. Uh, Roots Culture, Nexo token, worth getting interest paid out in Nexo? I prefer interest getting paid out in Bitcoin myself. Um, unless you need the utility of the token to get cheaper loans like you can with Celsius, um, and Celsius has zero inflation, so not shilling Celsius, but uh, the Nexo token is also good, but I always prefer, if at all possible, get paid out in Bitcoin. Pure form, original and the best, safest. Uh, a young dev, officially a whole coiner, thanks to you. Well done. Fantastic news. We have, uh, within the community now, there's over 800 whole coiners. So everybody watch my video on 20 steps to keep your crypto safe. Very important. Um, so what are your thoughts on borrowing against your crypto? When is it wise and when is not wise? Well, there's, it depends what you want to do with it. It's good to borrow against your crypto if you're going to invest in something that's growing, like a piece of real estate. So if you can borrow against your crypto, pull out some money, make a down payment on a condo, that will appreciate by 15% per year. That is a very, very safe thing to do. So you always need to think, but don't borrow to speculate because that's dangerous. That's layering risk upon risk. And that is something you don't want to do. Um, but yeah, just make sure whatever you invest in is safe and growing like real estate. And then it's a good thing to do. There's Team Metallica back, Justice for All. Curious if you've done a true cost ownership for EV versus gas vehicle. Drove Model 3 and it's amazing. How solar and looking to make the switch. Yes, I have. Uh, it is mind blowing how much you save. Um, it's nearly three years ago I bought the Model X. It was kind of crazy at the time, you know, buying a six digit electric car, but uh, nothing ever goes wrong with it. Just plug it in. There's no impact in your home electricity bill. Um, I had to change front tires after three years. That's it. And I didn't probably didn't even have to change them. But Tesla said, oh, you get some new tires. So I said, why not? I mean, there's just no cost, no wiper blades, no oils, <laughs> no, no cost to run. And I had to go to a supercharger. I was doing a long road trip the other day. Uh, I had to drive 240 miles, stopped at a supercharger, 16 bucks to tank the car. So um, if I was driving a petrol SUV in California at $5 a gallon, my last car was uh, a X6 Sports uh, from BMW, and that had a 22-gallon tank. So the cost to tank that was well over $100. And that wouldn't get me 200 miles. So <laughs> it's just way, way cheaper. So Justice Roll, go get it. Model 3, you may have to wait till January or February to get one because they're all sold out. Uh, Hyro, again, I've done some calculations. And if I invest 5K today in Bitcoin and 5K in ETH, and based on your price predictions to 2030, I earn at least 30% more on Bitcoin. Should I buy ETH? Bitcoin equals more gains and safety. Yeah, I always think in terms, it's a, a tough question, but for me... 
I like it to be 60% Bitcoin or 65% Bitcoin because it is the safest. And I don't need to speculate to make money. I'm happy with mediocre returns. But if you look at Bitcoin averaging a doubling or tripling every year for the last 11 years, even if it goes to like a 30% compound annual growth rate for the next five years, the returns will still be bombastic. Nothing can touch it. So Ethereum will run faster. Um, and it, it, like I always say, if Bitcoin goes up 2x, Ethereum will do a 3x, sometimes even a 4x. So uh, take that, but just make sure you have your balance correct. Uh, try B, if you have 5k, 5k, I'd make it 6k, 4k. 6k in Bitcoin, 4k in Ethereum, just to be safe. There's a lot more risk with Ethereum, but a lot more upside too. They have the store of value. They're becoming deflationary with ETH 2.0, but we'll see. Uh, Caligula, good to see you for Pedro. And will the China situation impact VeChain? Uh, 33 cent price prediction. Um, I don't know. I think the VeChain crew is so ingrained with the Chinese government that they will be safe. And in fact, they may even get additional investments because those economies that are smart to rebound something like this, they have to invest in infrastructure. VeChain is infrastructure. Blockchain is infrastructure. And that's why it's so weird that the US has like a $4 trillion infrastructure bill. And you know this well yourself. And how much is allocated to blockchain investments? None. It's stupid. It's like, it's like I go back to the thing, it's like buying um, aircraft carriers and tanks. Because the next war is not going to be a war with aircraft carriers and tanks. It's going to be with technology and data and blockchains and stuff. So anyway, uh, thank you, Caligula. Hope that helps. <laughs> and uh, Prince Philip, OG, did you ever look at quantum or glitch with your coin compendium? Quantum, yes. Quantum, we had a good look at. And it actually scored really, really well. And I'm glad you said that on the compendium. But there's a couple of other issues outside of the compendium that kept us away, both in terms of valuation, um, but from a tokenomics, centralization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Really, really good partnerships, really good, but it just didn't warrant an investment. But that was one of the best that ever ran through our compendium, the top 12%. So great question. Max Alto, if we invest in social token universe, the metaverse, what's the fastest horse to invest in? And where can we buy it? So there's a couple of things I'm looking at right now. I don't want to give them out yet, but there's three names that we're digging hard into, and that's going to be a whole part of our metaverse play. We're digging deep at finding the safest, best assets. But this space is so new, so complicated, and there's a couple of things about to launch too that I'm looking at. One of them is actually on the Solana ecosystem, which actually has me intrigued, and the two others are not. So stay tuned for that, Max Alto. Um, as soon as we find it, we will share with you guys. Uh, Henry Bailey, uh, that, that is if there is something better than the top 10 that we have. Henry Bailey, uh, you're up late. Have you heard of the crypto trader Glenn Goodman? He wrote a book on crypto trading. I was wondering if you knew if it was any good. I haven't. And uh, people always ask me, have I heard of this or that? And I tend to stay in my own little tunnel vision world. And I don't look out of it too much because I don't want to be poisoned by some of the information that's out there. I'd rather come to my own conclusions, but I will definitely check out that uh, book. But crypto trading is its really a bit of a misnomer. I'm not a day trader. I am a little bit of a swing trader and an investor. And I like to get in things early and wait and then accumulate. That's kind of my play. So if he is truly a trader, uh, that could be dangerous. I do do a little bit of though, and watching things get to my certain price point and exit them and put them in different places. Uh, so we'll see. But I will check out that book, Henry, and let you know. Rick, uh, what do you think has the most growth potential from now on, Matic or Cardano? It depends on how much um, Cardano adoption there is, but I think there's a much higher probability of Matic doing a 3x than a Cardano doing a 3x. So that's my take. I hope I don't get any harm there, but I just see there's so much that Polygon is doing in so many areas. And again, my thesis is nobody has recognized the value. It, it, it is mind blowing. And I know they had a huge run earlier this year and it's kind of like taking a long three, four month breather, but uh, people will click to Matic. And I do believe Matic will still be very much required for ETH. 
And I think uh, Vitalik and the team will start opening up more to Matic to help them be an interim solution before they get to sharding to help them scale. So that's kind of my thesis and theory. And once that happens, it's it's off to the races for Matic. Uh, because if you look at the combo of Matic and Ethereum versus the combo of Cardano with them building up their own system, Ethereum already has it. They just need to make it work. And that, <laughs> that's, that's the way I see it. So it's like Ethereum have all the money in their hand they just need to shake it a little bit to make it really turn into a huge amount of money. So it's probably a bad analogy. Anyway, Kevin Brown, uh, will you do a retirement video on portfolio with multiple coins? Yes, I will, Kevin. Uh, it's coming next week. So Justice Full, you're back again. Um, would you look at the following characters? Daughters of Cambodia, Operation Underground Railroads and Maps. Yes, um, I, I think you mean charities instead of characters. And we will definitely have a look at that uh, for sure. And Caligula, what's your beer of choice? Uh -huh. I actually, this is going to sound really weird, but I actually like Asahi. It's a dry Japanese beer and nice on a hot day to have one of those, one of those big metal cans. So uh, Japanese beer, who would have thunk it? Uh, and thank you for your donation. Dragonfire, thanks for all your information and education. My pleasure. Heather, thank you. I'm so happy that I found you. I'm happy that you're here. Everybody here is so kind and nice, and that's very rewarding. Frank Stewart, Tim Covell, grab a six pack. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't have spoken about beer, and everybody wants a beer. Uh, Chicken Wise, Beer Money, Jeff Hammer, <laughs> Trish Hill, Frank Stewart, J Dude, Snowfall, Jono UK123, Playing with Pastels, Frank Stewart, and Mike McGraw, and. Elliot Balin, Bright 007. Bright 007, I hope you like the little staring down the barrel of a gun James Bond thing I had in the slides. And uh, Steve Pat, Tuna's on Toast. And Tuna's on Toast again. Thank you so much, guys. And we'll have some new sponsorships of Where All Your Money Goes this weekend. So thanks, everybody. See you soon.